All right. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our third event in the Talking Politics series. This series is organized by the University of Chicago Center for the Study of Communication and Society, together with the University of Colorado Boulder's program in Culture, Language, and Social Practice. My name is Josh Babcock, and I am a PhD candidate in linguistic anthropology at the University of Chicago. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I want to begin by thanking all of you for joining us here in this series, where anthropologists and linguistics experts analyze the ongoing US presidential election. Today, we are very happy to have Professor Jonathan Rosa from the University of Stanford Graduate School of Education who will be sharing a talk whose title is slightly different from what you may see on screen uh, a moment ago, titled Communicating Crisis, Getting Back to Who's Normal in the 2020 US Presidential Election. Jonathan has added an alternate title, Indexical Order and the Diacritics of Ratio-Linguistic Life. If the meaning of this title isn't immediately obvious to you, don't worry, you're in the right place, since we'll all be learning together from Jonathan as he walks us through his analysis here. After the presentation, we will hear some discussant comments from Professor Jennifer Delfino from the City University of New York. After this, we'll open the floor for a Q&A. So to those of you who are blessed to not have been living on Zoom for the past few months, or if you're still new to the Zoom webinar format for any reason, let me briefly explain what this looks like. To ask a question, you can do so by locating the button marked Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you click on the button, a new window will pop up where you can post a question. We encourage questions at any time during the webinar and we will try our best to answer as many of them as we can after the presentation. As a brief note on our expectations for your participation, we understand that politics can be a delicate subject. So to encourage a constructive and fruitful experience for everyone, including our presenters, we will be closely monitoring the discussion and removing any inappropriate or unconstructive content from the Q&A window. So without any further ado, it is now my privilege to hand things over to Jonathan to begin his presentation. Jonathan, please. Thank you, Josh, for that introduction. Uh, I just need one moment to go ahead and, and share my PowerPoint, and then we can get started. OK, so it's, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you all today and to be in conversation with you. Uh, I want to thank the, the organizers of this event, uh, Josh and, and all of the, the other students. Um, I uh, am especially honored um, to, to participate in an event uh, that in, in uh, many ways uh, is informed and inspired by the work of Michael Silverstein, um, who has profoundly influenced my thinking over the years and inspired my thinking. And I'm, I'm grateful for uh, uh, his mentorship over the years. And in many ways, I, I would like to dedicate this, this talk to him, hence the, the second title, um, which is a play off of uh, his conceptualization of indexical order. So uh, I seek to, to build on that to think about uh, what I'm calling indexical disorder. I'm also really excited to be part of a conversation or part of a, a speaker series where uh, the first two presentations have been absolutely wonderful. So I was excited uh, to hear Adam Hodges talk uh, um, in, in the first session of the series, particularly his analysis of, uh, of this question of plausible deniability, the, the idea that what Trump, what Donald Trump is, is doing, uh, part of the strategy that he uses is to uh, open up a space or engage in practices that allow him to uh, um, perform uh, a certain kind of in, incendiary or inflammatory behavior while also uh, maintaining the ability to deny having done so. And so I think that's really powerful um, work that Adam's doing, particularly in terms of the question of how you uh, maintain civil discourse or presidential discourse or debate discourse that I'll be discussing uh, in the context of a, a bad faith actor and the question of whether Donald Trump is just a troll and a bad faith actor and what you do in response to that kind of a figure. Um, while in some ways I'm interested in those who are widely recognized and framed as trolls or bad faith actors, uh, I'm in some ways more interested in who we think of as a good faith actor and what we take for granted in stipulating what good faith uh, action is uh, in a place like the United States and the modern world. 
Um, I was also really excited to, to build on some of the ideas that Michael Lempert uh, shared in uh, his presentation uh, most recently, uh, particularly Michael's analysis of gesture and the way in which I think Michael is disrupting the assumption that Trump is somehow uh, uh, exceptional uh, in terms of his presentation of self. Well, of course, there are novel things and unique things that Donald Trump is doing. I think what Michael powerfully demonstrated in his analysis is that the Washington outsider persona or the strategy of projecting or, or cultivating a, a persona of being a Washington outsider is actually a widely recognizable strategy. And so what Donald Trump is doing is not necessarily particular to him in any straightforward way. And we would be well served by trying to draw some connections between what he's been doing and what various political figures have been doing. So Michael showed us how, for example, figures like John uh, McCain carved out this maverick uh, persona, figures, contemporary liberal figures, like or progressive figures like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, has also carved out this persona of being an outsider. So uh, for McCain, that looked like being a maverick. For uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, it looks like her use of various social media platforms uh, to discuss policy while cooking, while uh, engaging in makeup tutorials as well. And so uh, uh, Donald Trump as a kind of businessman of sorts, and I won't comment on his tax returns and him being broke and all of this kind of thing, but this question of him being an outsider uh, and, and uh, the, the kinds of behaviors in which he is engaging are, are actually quite bipartisan. And so I want us to think critically about that. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and get into my presentation. Um, so I'll focus on three primary sorts of issues. Uh, first, like a good linguistic anthropologist, I'll look at some meta discourse uh, particularly commentary about the breakdown of civility and communicative norms in the context of the 2020 US presidential debates, the two of them that have taken place. Um, and I'll, I want to look at the ways that efforts to, to return to a civil discourse or a kind of normalcy, I want to interrogate what normal, how normal is being conceptualized from what I frame as a, a racio-linguistic perspective. And I'll say what I mean by that uh, moving forward. And then finally, I want to propose an alternative approach that focuses on what I'm calling indexical disorder as a starting point. And I want to suggest that we would be well served by kind of redirecting our focus to presuming uh, that orderliness maybe hasn't ever been what's happening in a straightforward way and disorder is the starting point. And if, if disorder is what we're trying to document, um, how could that be a tool for disrupting some of the uh, some of what has come to be positioned as normative in a place like the United States. Um, so we can get into it by looking at some of the discourses surrounding the US presidential debates. The first debate took place on Tuesday, uh, September 29th, just about a month ago. And there were all kinds of conversations about this being the worst debate in US history, with some even worried about the international implications of Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden engaging in a, a set of exchanges um, that many people found to be deeply uh, upsetting and deeply offensive and uncivil. Uh, often uh, th there was a, a, a many sorts of, um, um, I think, representations and conversations about this alleged incivility um, and they took various forms. You could look at videos like this, which, and I want you to note the use of music, the use of image editing to demonstrate Donald Trump encroaching on Joe Biden uh, in, in the debate. And this is what that looks like. The and the hundred million started. people, Joe, the hundred million people is totally wrong. I don't know where you got that number. The bigger problem that you have, private health care, that they're very That's happy simply with. not true. Well, you're he certainly going that. to socialists. You're ahead. going to this, socialist this, this is, we're, we're now under, gentlemen, under my proposal. It's not what you've said, but and it's not what your is, party has said. That is simply Your party doesn't say it. Your party wants simple. to go socialist my medicine. My party is and me. And socialist right health now, I am And the they're going to dominate party. you, Joe. You know that. Here, Look, you, it wouldn't be deal. 200. It would be 2 million people <laughs> because you were very late on the draw, which was heavily President. You would have been much later, Joe. Mr. President. Much later. Mr. President. You're talking about 2 million people. President as a moderator. <laughs> a great deal of attention was in fact focused on the role of Chris Wallace as the moderator in the first debate and his alleged failure to maintain civility and to prevent interruption from taking place. And I was fascinated by the assumption that there are these rules in place that people will follow, that a, mo a moderator uh, can oversee um, 
the regulation of in some straightforward way. Uh, and, and, and various sorts of figures were concerned about um, the, or, or, or uh, satirized the failure of someone like Chris Wallace and, and his capacity to maintain or to prevent Donald Trump from interrupting uh, Joe Biden. And so this is what Jimmy Kimmel had to say about uh, that first debate on his uh, late night television talk show. If you missed the debate tonight, basically it went like this. Vote now. You're going to pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people know he doesn't want you're to a senator. The question. I'm not going to answer the question. Why because, would you answer that because question? Because the you question is, the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, your, man. Listen, who is on your list, Joe? It was like the moderator wasn't. Trump treated Chris Wallace like he was Eric asking for more allowance money. You know things are getting heated when the moderator pleads, please, gentlemen, let's return to the topic of race. <laughs> We'll get to Jimmy Kimmel's last point around how, how race is figured in these conversations and what kind of a, a topic race is constructed as and, and what conversations are conversations about race and then what conversations are presumed to be some conversations about something else. Uh, many media outlets uh, had a, a, great deal, a, a great deal to say about what was happening during the debates. The Washington Post, for example, counted more than 90 interruptions during the 90 minute debate, uh, more than three fourths of which they attributed to Donald Trump. And they suggested that this mode of interruption was part of a broader strategy of incivility and a, a broader strategy alongside Donald Trump's um, false or misleading claims, 20,000 of which the Washington Post has attributed to Donald Trump. And I'm interested in these uh, questions about uh, fact checking and, and, and questions about what rules would prevent someone like Donald Trump from engaging in particular kinds of behaviors. The idea that facts are well established and that we can fact check him and count the number of mistruths or misleading statements, and that will somehow upset or unsettle what he's up to. Uh, that assumption that, that that fact helps to get us somewhere is, is deeply fascinating to me. So I wanna think about that really critically. Um, there were also communications experts who were weighing in on this situation, including linguists and sociolinguists, trying to help Joe Biden along, and they acknowledge the ways in which Joe Biden's political brand, his persona as being reasonable, presented him with a, a, a complicated, uh, or put him in a complicated position where uh, if he were to respond aggressively or too aggressively, uh, that that would uh, contradict that persona. And yet if he were too passive, it would call into question his leadership. And so some linguists were suggesting that Joe Biden should try to cut Donald Trump out of the debate and just speak directly to the audience and to viewers. Others were suggesting that he should draw explicit attention to Donald Trump's uh, interruptions and ask whether Donald Trump is afraid of what he has to say. Um, again, I'm interested in, in these sorts of strategies and what kind of game people think is being played and, and what they're trying to win uh, uh, by engaging in these strategies. But there were also other sorts of efforts to implement checks and balances. And I'm interested again in a place like the United States, uh, this idea that there are checks and balances that we can put in place to prevent someone um, like Donald Trump from engaging in particular behaviors. And many people expected or were hoping that uh, after the 2016 election, that all of our nation's democratic institutions and the integrity of those institutions, the checks and balances built into them would help to prevent Donald Trump from engaging in particular kinds of behaviors. Again, I'm interested in what kind of history they imagined as existing prior to Donald Trump um, that was going to, to somehow shift or, or be maintained, I should say, in the context of his presidency. And so the debate commission in, in instituted a, a, a new uh, measure, which they suggested to be clear, uh, they wanted to, to offer uh, um, a mute, a mute sort of, sort of uh, structure where um, the first uh, two minutes of each of the six segments in the second debate, uh, each candidate had two minutes to respond in, that, uh, in, in each of those segments uh, and their opponent would be muted uh, during that moment. And again, I'm just really interesting, or interested in the assumption um, that, that these kinds of rules would uh, ensure civility and a, a particular kind of, of civility. Of course, many social media commentators noted that the, the mute button appeared not to be working during the debate on some level, or it wasn't being used. And people were uh, concerned about whether this was preventing um, someone like Joe Biden from 
uh, being able to participate in the debate meaningfully. And so for them, they're referring to, referring to the mute button that many of us have grown accustomed to using in the context of our virtual, our, our transition to virtual life uh, during the pandemic. And so in, in response to these conversations about the, these being the worst debates ever, a lack of civility, there's a, a call to return to civil discourse in a particular way. And I'm fascinated by the ways that many liberals seem to be sort of uh, ignorant of the, the way in which that's the Janus face of make America great again in, in some sense. So uh, what, what's at stake in, in, in advocating or presuming that there was kind of a, a civility that existed prior to Donald Trump and the United States. And so if you look at the profound histories of violence that have taken place throughout the entirety of US history, I'm curious when the US was a civil place. And I, I, I really want to know what moment people are pointing to, uh, what specific dates are involved, what social relations and what experiences they're privileging as they suggest that America was at some point civil, a settler colony and a slave society. I want to know what kind of civility ever existed here and whose experiences we're privileging as we articulate or, or call for a return to that kind of a civility, who was safe uh, historically and who never has been safe in a place like the United States. Of course, these contemporary kinds of conversations about the debates and a return to civility are, are not just the Janus face of make America great again, but they also echo and, and I think work in interdiscursive relation to uh, efforts or calls to uh, or, or lamentations about a return, the need to return to normal in the context of a global pandemic. So I'm interested in about a return to civility and a return to normalcy in a certain way in the context of the pandemic and this question of when our institutions are, are going to go back to operating as normal, when uh, schools will, will be normal again. And I wanna think really critically about what was ever normal in these spaces. And, and again, whose perspectives we were privileging, we privilege by uh, uh, advocating that kind of a return. Um, so I, I uh, want to think again about the ways that this sort of uh, pandemic, uh, this pandemic crisis and the crisis of incivility have been articulated in relation to a range of other national and global crises, particularly what people frame as a contemporary crisis of racism. And, and some people seem to have discovered this crisis uh, as of March, 2020, as though it emerged um, sui generis in this, uh, the last six to seven months or so. Um, others have of course pushed back to suggest that there's a long history of this violence in a place like the United States, such that even in the context of a, a pandemic 100 years ago that took place alongside profound anti-Black racist violence, uh, that what's happening right now is not entirely new, that the protests of anti-Black police violence in response to the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in uh, 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 Minneapolis and, and Louisville, uh, respectively, um, are, are part of a, a long history and a structure that's been in place uh, since the, the emergence of the United States. And so um, this idea that, that racism is a, a specifically contemporary crisis um, is, is a, a, a striking kind of claim. I'm also interested in the, the medicalization of racism, the idea that racism is also a pandemic. And you hear many people using the phrase or discussing the other pandemic of, of racism. And uh, I'm deeply uh, following Adia Benton and, and many other scholars. I'm deeply concerned about this kind of biologization or medicalization of racism uh, because of the ways that many people then orient to racism as though what we need to do is develop a vaccine or a cure for it. And if we could administer that cure, which has taken place, you know, I think through the creation and the proliferation of all kinds of anti-racist training. So everyone wants to become an anti-racist now. So my question is always, okay, so, so that in, you as an individual become, became an anti-racist. And so, okay, what happens now? Um, so this, this idea that you can cure racism through this biologized in response to this biologized, medicalized framing of racism is deeply concerning and deeply dehistoricizing. So it doesn't locate race or the emergence of racism in relation to a very particular history of the globalization of European colonialism, the onset of settler colonialism, enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade in the United States, and the, the histories of targeting very particular kinds, very particular populations. Um, so when we think about um, the effort towards creating a cure, uh, it was fascinating again to observe the response to uh, um, a, a, an effort to, to respond to um, 
pro racial protests and demands or, or protests of racial uh, against racial violence and police violence and demands for institutional change. So institutions changed by drafting statements and various brands were releasing statements. So Amazon releases a statement. In some cases, these were just so completely insidious where institutions and organizations that have profoundly inequitable um, working conditions and labor conditions, profound histories of violence and racism like the NFL, anti-indigenous racism like the NFL, anti-black racism like the NFL were releasing statements suddenly. And I, I was shocked. I mean, I have to say many university departments where there's been nary a, a faculty member of color at all, much less a black faculty member, quickly transitioning to adopt a discourse of anti-blackness without any kind of understanding of the history of that framework and, and the understandings that are associated with it. Also institutions quickly shifting to a discourse of so-called systemic racism. Um, so out of one side of the mouth, framing things systemically as though this were a structural issue and, out, uh, and then practically orienting to racism as though it were primarily an interpersonal issue. And so lots of people traffic in the discourse of, um, of, of, of racial wokeness in some ways without um, I think substantially matching that with, with a, a, an analysis of um, the structures that have produced racism and, and sustain it in places like the United States. Of course, Donald Trump was not going to be left out of this discussion about racism. And in fact, uh, is it issued a month, about a month and one week ago, issued uh, an executive order against uh, race and sex stereotyping, against particular kinds of trainings, diversity trainings, and even articulating a, a critique of so-called critical race theory, which from his perspective, I think refers to any theory that discusses race. So in this respect, he wasn't speaking specifically to the legal studies framework that Derek Bell, Patricia Williams, Kimberly Crenshaw, and many others have developed that have, has then been inspired work across institutional settings. So it wasn't about the framework that the conceptual framework we think of as critical race theory it was more broad discourses uh, about racism and against racism as an institutional problem um, that proposed particular kinds of interventions that Donald Trump was speaking in opposition to. And it's interesting to look at how racism gets defined from these various perspectives that, all, that often look as though they're competing but operate in tandem in different ways. So part of what I want to suggest um, and this is building on, on work that I've done um, with Yari Malbonia and others, is that it's really important for us to refuse to exceptionalize Donald Trump and to refuse to, to make this conversation about this exceptionally racist individual, this exceptionally troublesome political figure, when in fact he's part of a long standing history. And the exceptionalization and individualization of racism, I think we have to push back against to recognize, in fact, that many of the scripts, the, the dog whistles that Donald Trump, so uh, his dog whistle to, the, to the, the Proud Boys recently, is part of bipartisan dog whistles. So whether it's Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden and discussions of so-called super predators, many liberals have, have trafficked in these kinds of racist discourses. And so this idea that this, these kinds of dog whistles are particular to Donald Trump is deeply troubling. And when we individualize and exceptionalize Trump, we, it leads us to a situation where someone like Kamala Harris looks like progress, where um, a, a racial and gender position out of context entirely, so just by itself a racial and gender position um, allows some people to uh, imagine her figure, her personhood as a sign of progress. We saw similar things with Barack Obama and we'd wanna think about the ways that exceptionalizing Trump prevents us from understanding how Trump is in fact built on an architecture that Obama helped to create and that previous democratic presidentials, pre presidential administrations uh, created as well. And so whether we're talking about mass incarceration, police violence, uh, uh, detention and deportation, um, imperial war, these are projects that are bipartisan commitments in a place like the United States. And so I want to think really critically about how we define progress, where a vice president, a, a Democratic vice presidential candidate who's a Black woman and is also a prosecutor um, is being advanced as a sign of progress. So to be clear, Kamala Harris is not Shirley Chisholm. And so we'd have to look at very particular histories to think about what a radical, a, a radical project of, of social change might look like. Um, and I want to propose that a way of, of proceeding 
would be to look, uh, to look to what I'm framing as indexical disorder. Um, so this is again inspired by M Michael Silverstein's framework of indexical order uh, as a way of making sense of the relationship, the dynamic relationship between signs and contexts. And I won't go into deep detail about indexical or, uh, uh, his framework of indexical order, um, but I will say that part of what I want to do by extending um, or, or by redirecting focus to disorder is to suggest that some of the order, orderliness, the civility, the normalcy that we presume exists in a place like the United States or has existed in previous historical moments is a profound distortion in many ways. And, and I want to suggest that by centering an analysis of disorder, it opens up a, a, a possibility of unsettling those histories and, and interrogating them and making sense anew of, our, of what we're facing in the contemporary moment. So as I, I conceptualize indexical disorder, I'm drawing uh, deep inspiration from feminist, what I think of as feminist projects within linguistic anthropology, particularly the conceptualization of erasure. And I say feminist projects within linguistic anthropology that center power in the analysis and center positionality in the analysis. And so these questions about uh, erasure that uh, Susan Gall and, and Judith Irvin have conceptualized as a framework for making sense of a, a, a semiotic process of differentiation, the creation of borders, the creation of boundaries, the creation of hierarchies, the role of erasure in terms of maintaining those sorts of separations. And I want to build on their framework as well um, to suggest an, a, 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 a different kind of focus um, from erasure to what Adrian Lowe, uh, my colleague Adrian Lowe and I are calling presenting. So um, we're, we're interested, of course, in what's being uh, elided or erased, but also in what people imagine as being present in the first place. So not just that which is occluded or elided, but that which, which people understand to be empirically present. What is this reality? Where, where do we live? Where are we? What are these positionalities that people are inhabiting? And what are the practices in which they're engaging? Um, how is it that we, what are the, the, the tools that we have for uh, documenting them, understanding them, and recognizing them in particular ways? And this is part of this analysis that Adrian Lowe and I, and I should say Adrian and I have been working on this for several years now, but it's a slow cooked meal. And so it's gonna, it's taking time for us to pull this together. So you gotta be patient, but you know, we've been working on it for some time, but it's tied to also my work with Nelson Flores um, and our project of, of conceptualizing what we call a racial linguistic uh, perspective and, and what I'm framing here as the production of racial linguistic worlds. And so this analysis of presenting in, in terms of asking what is here, what do we imagine as being empirically here, I think is, is central to the, the racial linguistic framework that I've tried to develop with Nelson and others to suggest that our focus on the language practices of marked and marginalized and racialized subjects doesn't help to explain how those practices are framed or perceived or represented um, in a range, a range of contexts. So uh, I work in a, a graduate school of education now, so I pay very close attention to educational language classifications. And in US schools, you have classifications like English language learner and long-term English learner that are used to, to designate the practices of students who might identify as monolingual English users. So you could self-identify as English dominant or a monolingual English user throughout your entire life and yet still be designated as a long-term English learner or an English language learner in ways that prevent you from accessing uh, particular kinds of educational opportunities. And so in that respect, I'm interested not in trying to find out what kids are doing with language by itself or in a vacuum, but how that language use is being perceived and, and made present as a problem or as deficient, as in need of remediation. And so um, um, from whose perspective and, and from whose position of power are practices, particular populations practices made in unintelligible, turned into different varieties or different languages, produce one form and are perceived as producing another form. That's the analysis of presenting that I, I want to advance here. And so I, I want to um, turn now to a few examples of presenting and then tie them back to this discussion of these discussions of civility, of normalcy and of de-exceptionalizing someone like Donald Trump. Um, so let's look at a, a, a few cases of presenting or ways we could begin con to conceptualize a, a framework of presenting. Um, at the beginning of the current academic year, there was a, a, a widespread um, 
outcry and in response to an incident at the University of Southern California, where a business communication professor um, uttered a phrase that from some perspectives was a, a Mandarin, an example of a Mandarin hedge, a linguistic hedge, uh, like um or uh, and for other, from other perspectives was experienced and perceived as a racist epithet, the N-word uh, in, in this particular case. And what I'm interested in analyzing here is the way in which the discussion surrounding this event uh, in, in many cases ended up individualizing this, this particular professor and uh, essentializing the linguistic forms involved such that there was a debate about whether a racist is present and whether racist language forms are present. And the effort then, or the response then is to get rid of the racist and get rid of the racist language forms rather than as the students, as many uh, black students in this class and their allies in this class were demanding institutional change in response to this, not just uh, an individual uh, punishment for this professor, but rather thinking about the ways that institutions, uh, uh, their particular kinds of orientations to uh, uh, providing safeguards for students, to ensuring that uh, they are experiencing safe learning communities and providing frankly uh, safeguards to, to professors and students of color um, that universities are let off the hook by the individualization of this kind of an incident. Um, and so it's been interesting to track the ways that the students have attempted to push back and make this into an institutional problem and not an individual problem. But I want us to kind of think really critically about um, the ways that these debates often reduce to these individualized sorts of framings. And Adam Hodges has written powerfully about um, these individualized framings as well and the question of whether a racist is present. And I, again, I want us to think about um, the ways that an identity as a racist or as an anti-racist doesn't help to get us very far in understanding how racism operates and functions as an institutional systemic phenomenon. So in this particular example, uh, it was a debate about minute linguistic forms and features and this individual professor. Um, in other examples, there are questions about um, whether there are distortions and fraudulence and fraudulence and misrepresentations in relation to one's entire persona, in this case, a, an entire and registered model of identity. Uh, a woman named uh, Jessica Krug, who was a history professor um, and who uh, claimed a, a black Puerto Rican identity um, when she was in fact a, a white woman. And so this question of what she is in fact is interesting to me um, in this conversation about Jessica Krug. Of course, uh, she accessed many opportunities that are designated for black women uh, and for Puerto Rican women and for black Puerto Rican women specifically. And, uh, and, and, and also engaged in practices that policed the behaviors of other black women and other black Puerto Rican women and black Latinas. And so uh, she caused tremendous harm interpersonally through this kind of uh, presentation of self. But I, again, I want us to think really critically about the relationship between this individual harm that she created and a set of institutional practices that produced the possibility of this kind of an incident. So if we make this just about the pathology of this particular individual, just like in the previous example, if we make this about a, an individual professor uh, who is engaging in these language practices that, could, that are uh, uh, interlingual and uh, could be uh, perceived in one way or another, then we misrecognize or we prevent ourselves from, in some cases, understanding the institutional dynamics involved. So here, by, uh, in, in the case of, of this woman uh, who, claims, uh, who claimed to be a Black Puerto Rican uh, a woman, uh, the effort to pathologize her, I worry that it lets institutions off the hook and for many of us who are part of higher education uh, and colleges and universities throughout the United States and the world, it lets all, all of us off the hook in terms of the role that we're recruited to play in reproducing these essentialized ideas about race and ethnicity. Uh, and so many institutions, I think uh, as Sarah Ahmed, as Bonnie Urcioli, as Shalini Shankar have powerfully sort of argued that institutional projects of diversity participate in the creation of the conditions, the neoliberal commodification of diversity the idea that diversity is, is profitable, that it, it makes you more viable, it gives you uh, more opportunities in some, in some kind of uh, unproblematic way, are precisely what recruit, I think, uh, particular individuals to, uh, from certain kinds of dominant or privileged backgrounds to claim marginalized identities. And so I want us to maintain our focus 
um, simultaneously on the interpersonal and individual harm involved here, because that's substantive, what, what this woman did. But I also want us to focus very carefully on the institutional dynamics involved that created the conditions of possibility for this kind of behavior in the first place. And, uh, um, and, and this effort to just try to figure out whether um, she's really white or really a, a Black Puerto Rican woman, I think prevents us from interrogating the kinds of essentializations that are often used to define those categories in the first place, such that Black Puerto Rican womanhood gets defined and essentialized in relation to stereotypical physical features, stereotypical language practices, and gestural practices and forms of affect um, that then anyone could take on. And so I want us to push back against these sorts of essentializations. But what I've seen instead is often a doubling down on those essentializations to say, she's really a white woman. And as a white woman, these are the practices that she can engage in. And if she were a black Puerto Rican woman, that these are the practices that black Puerto Rican women engage in. And I, I want us to kind of think really critically about what's involved in those sorts of framings of what's going on here because of the, the ways that institutional dynamics fall out of the focus of those discussions. It's not to say that there isn't some sort of, uh, that there shouldn't be conversations about appropriation, uh, but those conversations should, uh, it's important to attend to both the interpersonal and, and uh, institutional dynamics. And lastly, I want to point to the example. So the first example was of minute linguistic features uh, and the, the question of, of whether racism is present there. The second example was an entire kind of model of personhood and whether this individual uh, and the, the, the persona that she created, whether, uh, that is, whether she is a racist and what she really is. Now, uh, the, the, my final example here, I want to point to a mediatized production and the way that it is framed in different historical moments. So here I'm talking about uh, the Lin Manuel Miranda uh, uh, show, uh, musical Hamilton, and the ways that during the Obama administration, the musical Hamilton was heralded as ushering in, uh, and I should say, Hamilton, a, a musical that recounts US history, but replaces the so-called founding fathers of US history with, um, with uh, uh, actors and performers of color. And so, uh, so this kind of rewriting of history was in one moment celebrated during the Obama administration as a sign of multicultural sort of uh, progress in a place like the United States. So that someone like Michelle Obama called it the best art ever. Many people have claimed that Hamilton is the best musical ever and that it's a sign of democracy. And, and, and I should say Lin-Manuel Miranda's, uh, an, uh, the inspiration for Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda is a Puerto Rican man and uh, uh, Hamilton is someone from St. Croix who uh, came to the United States, um, inspired someone like, uh, uh, or, or Lin-Manuel Miranda saw himself in someone like Hamilton. And it's interesting to, to sort of uh, uh, think about the perspective from which seeing oneself in the founding fathers of a settler colony and slave state is even possible in the first place for a, 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 a Puerto Rican man who's a member of a colony of the United States. Um, so what's interesting to me here is how during the Obama administration, Hamilton is a sign of progress and multicultural sort of a, a multicultural celebration. However, as of this summer, as Hamilton transitions to the screen from the stage, uh, it's television sort of rendering is framed as uh, somehow problematic during the Trump administration. So during the Trump administration, there are questions that emerge from some mainstream perspectives. To be clear, some of us were critical of Hamilton from the beginning, um, but others have, have found their way into this critique during the Trump administration where Hamilton doesn't feel so good anymore. And slavery doesn't feel so good anymore, but it felt good during the Obama administration. Uh, uh, slave owners were fun to celebrate then, and it was the best musical ever, the best art ever. But during the Trump administration, it's a problem. And so what I want to think really critically about is, why is it only in, a partic in this particular moment that we exceptionalize or, or problematize a production like this? Uh, and what's at stake in problematizing it exclusively in this moment as compared to previous moments? And so I wanna build from this kind of an analysis to talk about the, uh, in, in conclusion here as I wrap up, to talk about the ways that the narrow definition of racism as a problem um, often, and even our understandings of what a conversation about race looks like in practice, often narrowly defines race in ways that don't allow us to address these longstanding historical institutional dynamics. And so you see um, this tweet from Victor Ray um, in reference to the discussion about race in the most recent presidential debates. So you get a segment 
on race, which then cordons off uh, a, a particular set of, of dialogues as the, di the race dialogues. And then the rest of the conversation is about, is, is ostensibly about something else altogether. And what I want to suggest from a racio-linguistic perspective is that race is never not in the conversation and never not participating in organizing and anchoring people's experiences in profound ways, profoundly consequential ways. And I want to suggest that if we work from an analysis of indexical disorder, that we can interrogate that consequentiality really the, the, the forms of profound violence that have been made so mundane in a place like the United States that I worry that our analytical approaches have accepted them as a starting point for civility rather than interrogating them as that which we need to, to unsettle and, 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 uh, 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 and challenge. And so um, I guess I'm gonna leave it there for my, uh, my part of the presentation and I, I look forward to the dialogue, thank you. Right, thank you, Jonathan, for that very exciting presentation. It definitely gave me a lot to think about. And based on the questions that are already coming in, it seems that it's true for others here as well. Before we get to that, I would like to turn things over to our discussant for today, Jennifer Delfino. So Jen, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Chicago and the University of Colorado at Boulder for sponsoring this event. Thank you to Molly Ham Rodriguez, Velda Ku, Jacob Henry, and Wee Young So for organizing. I'd also like to thank Josh Babcock for moderating this talk. And of course, thank you to Dr. Jonathan Rosa for your talk this evening. I'm truly honored to be your discussant tonight. Dr. Rosa's talk provides us with an invaluable opportunity to rethink how the current political moment, which is widely understood to be exceptionally characterized by an emergent political incivility and racial violence, might in fact be the timely and predictable unveiling of a liberal democracy that, is, uh, that has in fact always been characterized by political incivility and racial violence. I want to draw attention to two themes that emerge from Jonathan's talk for further discussion. First, I want to invite discussion on the concept of indexical disorder as necessarily disruptive to the project of what is typically seen and heard in analyses of Trump's ascendancy, namely the restoration of what is widely seen as a return to order or to what is uh, considered normal and what a good faith actor looks like. How and why do we see Trump as an exceptional disruption of liberal democracy a mode of governance which still strikes many as a kind of legitimate political order, despite its foundational violences, including but not limited to systemic racism. Against what presumption of order exactly does Trump stand as a disruptive figure? Second, I want to ask participants to think about the themes of presenting and fraudulence in this current political moment. How and why do we as analysts participate and the reproduction of racial ontologies that implicate, but also reach beyond Trump by taking particular histories and structures of what Jonathan theorizes as indexical disorder for granted. As Jonathan emphasizes, the concept of indexical disorder is fundamental to challenging theoretical conversations and political discourses about racism and racial violence in the current moment. Through a detailed presentation of meta-commentary on the recent presidential debates, for example, he notes the tendency for commentators and news outlets to exceptionalize and individualize racial violence, such that racial violence is understood to be only a part of politics or society rather than foundational to them. As his examples show, it is also common to individualize and exceptionalize persons who are understood to be perpetuating systemic racism through what we understand to be discrete actions and activities rather than part of a longer history and structure of racial violence and racial essentialism that precedes the current political moment. As I understand it, this is why Jonathan goes beyond analyzing political discourse and the recent debates to analyzing instances in which racial violence as a historical and structural problem is embodied and emblematized in the kinds of words, actions, meta commentaries, and statements produced in the liberal uh, slash progressive social media and in the academy. As he notes, there is a plethora of trafficking in the discourse of racial wokeness, but not much actual effort towards dismantling the processes that have preceded 
and which supersede this particular moment. As Jonathan eloquently explains with reference to counter discourses and pushback on the framing of racial violence as re-emergent, racism and racists are not exceptions to the kinds of orders we imagine as normative, including the indexical orders that figure in the analysis of political figures, their words and their actions. As he reminds us, racial violence is in fact central to how analytical tools are recruited to interpret Trump and his ascendancy, particularly that of indexical order. He suggests that we shift from thinking about orders of what is posited as normal or ordinary to the disorder implied by positing particular kinds of relations between signs in their reference or contexts. With this in mind, I pose the following questions. Who yearns for a kind of political and social order that was presumed to exist prior to Trump? How is the desire for a so-called return to normalcy implicated in our own analytical projects as linguists and as anthropologists? Why is racial violence more commonly theorized as only part of the social and political context rather than as the lens through which we too, as analysts, interpret the actions of people, groups, and events? These questions are meant to speak directly to Jonathan's call to look at the historical and structural issues that both precede and supersede Trump as a seeming exception to the so-called liberal democratic order many so long to restore through the upcoming election. With regard to the second theme of presenting in fraudulence, Jonathan's talk shows us that the conceptualization of indexical order is rooted in a perspective that sees liberal democracy itself as orderly and as normal. And as he illustrates in the example of Jessica Krug and others who have been accused of perpetuating racism and producing interpersonal harm, neo, the, we in the neoliberal academy are all in some way positioned to engage in a sort of fraudulence that historically and structurally precedes the individual and the current political moment if we take the notion of indexical order on face value. To quote his 2017 co-authored article with Yari Marbonia, in which they call for a set of approaches to de deprovincializing Trump and decolonizing anthropology, quote, although there is room for native voices, there is rarely room for native theory. To put it quite bluntly in my own words, um, what is the point of inclusion if native anthropologists are not seen and heard on their own terms? Drawing on the insights of critical race anthropologist Faye Harrison, Rosa and Bonilla note further that there is a sort of exceptionalism occurring from within anthropology itself. That is to say, the hierarchies we as ethnographers seek to disrupt out there and the spaces conceptualized as the field are actually replicated in our own methods and perspectives. One of the shifts Jonathan asks us to take in the effort to decolonize our interpretations is to go beyond theorizing racial violence as a type of erasure to interrogate what is actually presented to us as orderly in the first place. What is made present for analysis via the concept of indexical order? How does, this, how does the notion of presenting help us understand how different people are positioned to hear and see order versus disorder in the first place? And what has it to do with racial violence as ordinary and as normal rather than, than exceptional? Jonathan's talk invites us to examine ourselves as part and parcel of the larger context of racial violence and as part of the reflexive tradition to reform the tools we have so that we can see how and why we reproduce the racial violences of liberal democracy. As his discussion of indexical disorder shows, anthropology is not an exception nor exceptional in this regard as an academic field. Fraudulence is institutionalized as part of theoretical and everyday engagements with what many liberals and progressive des progressives desire as normal and ordinary. That is to say, the rest restoration of a liberal democracy that has never actually existed for a great majority of people living in the United States. Racialization and racial violence are not produced alongside what we do theoretically. They are fundamentally at work in the perspectives, tools, perspectives and tools we foreground as part of our ongoing work despite discipline-wide efforts to the contrary. Jonathan's talk reminds us that we have perhaps not adequately disrupted racism or racial violence in our work, and that we participate in many of the wider processes we, we critique as scholars. I invite Jonathan to respond to my commentary and questions 
and for those participating in this upcoming discussion to consider them for, th for thoughtful dialogue on his eloquently delivered talk. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jen. This very rich set of comments that gave us even more to think with as we go into the collective Q&A. Uh, I would now invite Jonathan, as you have already done, to respond to any of these comments, if you would like, uh, before we open things up to the rest of the attendees. Thank you, Josh, and, and thank you, Dr. Delfino, for your, your comments. I really appreciate your, your critical engagement with this work, and, uh, and I, I hope to, to engage in ongoing dialogues, and I'm excited about your book that's coming out, um, so, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm happy to, to be in conversation with you. So I'll maybe just speak to a couple of issues from your commentary, um, and, and then we can maybe circle back to some of these issues moving forward. Um, so my, my tread lightly response to, to the question of, you know, what's going on with some of our intellectual projects and what informs these frameworks. I mean, as, some, as someone who is trained in a, a, as a linguistic anthropologist and a semiotically kind of informed linguistic anthropologist and as a pragmatist linguistic anthropologist, I have deep concerns about the philosophical project of pragmatism. And I have concerns about the analytics that it produces and whose realities it naturalizes and what realities then it allows, it allows us to analyze in very particular ways. And I'm concerned about the categories that we use to make sense of those realities. And so my, you know, if I'm, tre if I'm treading lightly, uh, you know, th then I say I, ha I have concerns. If I'm stomping, then I say, we have to ask some really serious questions about the depoliticized nature of many semiotic projects and, and, and a great deal of semiotic research. And this is why I said that the feminist sort of, I think the fem that many, many feminist uh, uh, linguistic anthropologists, whether it's the entire language ideologies project, um, you know, I think have reinvigorated, you know, have, have given some teeth to what uh, have made pragmatism into to something else um, that I find to be much more um, compelling and politically engaged. Um, so uh, that's, that's one of the questions. What's the historical moment that pragmatism emerges out of in the United States? And um, how does that shape the sorts of uh, our, our, its uptake analytically and the, the kinds of categories uh, and, and tools that we use to make sense of the world? Whose realities does it allow us to understand and whose realities aren't even on the radar? And I have to say, that's my, my stomping. I'm telling you, linguistic anthropology, you know, the, the discipline of linguistic anthropology, it's very clear that particular people have never been positioned as theorists within this field because their realities aren't, aren't uh, incorporated into the, the conception of the kinds of questions that we ask. So that's, that's one uh, piece. And uh, I guess I would just speak to one other issue, Jen. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Delfino. Um, so we've been in conversation, so it, it might be somewhat colloquial. It, 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 I'll shift between a, a, a colloquial register and a formal register. And now people are gonna say, Jonathan, are you reproducing uh, the idea that there is such a thing as form, uh, formal and colloquial? But anyways, um, I guess part of uh, another, um, another question or another kind of uh, uh, conversation that's really important to me is the, the ways that linguistic anthropologists and sociolinguists, critical language analysts, applied linguists, the, the theories of change that inform our work. And uh, this has been really important to my collaboration with Nelson Flores in terms of our efforts to, to sort of build on, I think, an era of uh, post-civil rights, civil rights and post-civil rights sociolinguistics. And I think Monica Heller and Bonnie McElhinney's book, Language, uh, Capitalism, Colonialism, and I never, I always get the order of capitalism and colonialism mixed up in their title, but I think that their work that traces the production of the field of, of sociolinguistics as a US based kind of project and the normative liberal attachments and investments in that project, I think inform the theories of change that many sociolinguists employ, which is championing the legitimacy and the rule governed nature of marginalized populations language practices, which is to say, oh, you know, what kids of color do is actually really skillful and really good and really valuable. And I think that that project made sense historically in a very particular moment. I think we're in a different moment now where people have demonstrated the rule governed nature of marginalized language varieties. And yet that hasn't unsettled the assumption of deficiency across institutions. And it suggests to me that we need a different orientation to the nature of the problem, which isn't, wasn't ever about the, the pra language practices of marginalized populations and was always about a, a foundational structure of power that would target 
any language practices in which particular populations engage. Um, so that's, that's uh, I guess, um, my initial response to, to some of your, your um, queries. And, and again, thank you for the engagement. Um, and Josh, I should say, I've been tracking the Q&A and I have responses to all the questions that are there right now. Um, so I'm happy to, to jump in on any of those or, um, but I'll let you moderate and you can pick whichever ones you, you think might be most fruitful for us to proceed with. Great, thank you, Jonathan. I just wanted to make a quick note. It seems that many of you are already finding the Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom window. It seems that many of you are also finding the upvote feature, but I just wanted to put it out there that even if you don't have a question of your own, you can always click on the little thumbs up icon to upvote questions that have been posted by others. Um, so I did actually have some sense of where it might be fun to go from here. Uh, we have a question from Jamal about um, the, what I understand to be, there's an accusation toward some contemporary activists that they are changing the meaning of racism. And here I'm going to read out the rest of the question, such that racism cannot even be conceptualized as systemic and can only be manifested by the actions of a person with a depraved heart. So how does this practice speak to the discourses of civility and constraining the terms of debate that you have discussed in your talk? Sorry, let me unmute. Um, so I guess part of the, the um, concern that I have in, in commentary about um, the activists, um, decontextualized commentary and in critiques of the activist and critiques of wokeness, this kind of thing is that they feel disconnected um, from engagement with communities and, and, um, and intergenerational kinds of projects of, of pushing back and making sense of in, in some cases, police violence, in other cases, various forms of, of uh, discrimination. And so uh, this idea that uh, activists can be, that we can make these generalizing sorts of um, statements about activists um, is troublesome to me. And so if anything, um, I, the, the concern, the concern uh, uh, around individualizing racism, and this is an important concern, but I don't think I, it's necessary to discredit activists in order to uh, engage critically with people as they're making sense of things from various perspectives. So if anything, it speaks to the significance of intergenerational dialogue, where we learn about the ways that the struggles that people are advancing right now are responding to this political moment, but they're also in dialogue they can also be put in dialogue with previous historical moments and previous political struggles to understand, okay, here's what we've learned. And when we approach things in terms of an individual, then this is what that opens up as a possibility and this is what it might foreclose. My concern with, again, the individual framing, um, this idea that you know diversifying the police force with officers of color, I, it just misunderstands the, the role that people of color can play in reproducing these systems. It, it's deeply concerning to me and I think it's a, a deeply distorted um, analysis of, of how racism works. In terms of you know, racism being located in the heart uh, or in a, a so-called depraved heart, that's fascinating you know, anthropologically in terms of how the body gets parsed and where racism might live and, and, uh, and how it might be approached or uprooted. Um, and, it, and it turns it into a sentiment uh, in a particular way. I think based on a, a, set, of, uh, a, a set of sort of um, gendered ideologies about where feeling lives and, and how feeling can be addressed. Um, and for some, again, I think that informs the creation of these anti-racist trainings and the effort to, to really change hearts and change minds without necessarily changing institutions at all. So um, the, these ideas that racism lives in hearts and minds rather than in institutional, historically structured institutional relations, um, I, I'm interested in talking about land, labor, and resources more than hearts and minds. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, just from my perspective, I think this also nicely links up to the comment that you had made earlier about the disease of racism uh, and an effort to sort of locate these effects in the body. So now this becomes a sort of, you know, a cardiological problem of racism in a sense. Uh, but I did want to give Jen an opportunity to respond or to share her views if she had any to, to contribute at this time with no pressure to do so if you if you um, thanks, Josh. I do have some thoughts on this. You know, I'm doing some um, preliminary research on the notion of white allyship as expressed by uh, people on Facebook. And it's really interesting because, 
you see kind of these nods or ways of trying to grapple with systemic racism that get folded back into this idea that racism is really present in the individual. And so, you know, it's very frustrating for me to, for example, to try and engage with white friends because what ends up happening is, you know, this idea of white virtue, you know, I'm not the one who's perpetuating systemic racism, that person is. And so it's almost like the, the whole concept of systemic racism because it becomes the opposite of what we intend to do with it in certain ways. And so I think there's really important work there to be done in trying to have, you know, whether it's cross-generational conversations, whether it's, you know, whatever um, kinds of dynamics are happening in this historical moment, it's, it's really important to try and like, you know, facilitate the idea that this is a set of historical and institutional relationships. It's not a person that you could point to and say, I'm not him or her. Right, thank you. Uh, both of you have mentioned in different ways this, uh, this matter about gender. And I think this links to a question from Sonia asking to speak more about gender violence and how it complicates the legacies of racial violence that reframe systemic inequalities as interpersonal and interactional in the United States, uh, which also, I guess, does prefigure our next uh, event in this webinar series. But we can, for now, turn it back to Jonathan and Jen to hear what you have to say about this. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate Sonia's question. I, I think it's really important to kind of figure out. It's. I think there have been a range of efforts to kind of push back against the way that uh, it's often men um, who are, it's when men are victims of particular kinds of racist violence um, that their experiences are centered, become the, the grounds on which political uh, mobilization takes place. Um, and I think that the effort to always say particular names, if you participated in any marches um, in the spring and in the summer, um, there are often Black women leading those marches, commemorating and centering Black women's experiences. Um, and Black women uh, victims of, of police violence and police brutality, um, hence the, the focus on, on uh, the killing of, of uh, Breonna Taylor with a no-knock warrant. Um, so I think the concern for me, um, and, and to be clear, when men are victims of police violence and of racist violence, we should attend to that violence. The question is, why do we narrowly attend to that violence? And how does our vision of a response or how does our imagination of a response of how does it become limited when we center men's experiences um, rather than kind of thinking uh, from, I think, Black feminist perspectives, particularly around um, what happens when you think from the margins of the margins, you create a different vision of the nature of the problem and uh, you expand your, your imagination of, of what kind of an intervention um, would be required. And that's why these abolitionist projects that are being articulated in 2020 are part of intergenerational Black feminist projects. We're talking about hundreds of years old projects of abolition that I, I want us to attend to, um, such that uh, uh, the, the, the need for a fundamentally different world. And to be clear, a different world that is not just deferred to a possible future, but a different world that various populations have had to already create out of necessity in order to sustain themselves. Different economies and kinship systems and modes of governance and approaches to education and approaches to health that various populations, abolitionist realities that are already in existence. And it's not to say that those realities can't be expanded and extended in new and in heretofore not, uh, ways that haven't existed yet. Um, but I, I think that people have been doing this work for a, a, a very long time. And did you have anything you would like to add to that? Um, not at this time, no, but I appreciate the question and it's something that I definitely want to reflect on in my own work. Great, thank you. I also wanted to go back to an earlier comment that Jonathan, you had made in response to Jen's discussion, just because I think this leads us into one of the, the questions that was posed in the Q&A, uh, where you talked about questioning the realities that pragmatics or pragmatism naturalizes, uh, which I think is a good connection to uh, DeAndre's question, who's a, pertaining to this issue of whose realities are or are not on the radar. Um, DeAndre asks, how do you reconcile the role of subjectivity in constructing reality in the sense of linguistic relativity together with political discursive strategies for spreading misinformation? 
whose reality might be seen as more real and how is that a linguistic formation, particularly from a racial linguistic perspective, with the caveat that this is not a straightforward or open-ended question and also uh, um, some applause at the end that you're a, a brilliant talk and you're the bomb and the kind of scholar the Academy needs. But yeah, do you have any comments on that, Jonathan? The praise I, included. I should say, I should have expected that DeAndre and Jamal, two brilliant doctoral students at the University of California, Santa Barbara in linguistics and sociocultural linguistics would come hard with, a, with their first couple of questions about linguistic relativity. So um, let me say, I would, I'm interested in expanding our analysis of linguistic relativity to a broader semiotic relativity in terms of understanding who, from whose vantage points particular realities are, are in existence. And in the, the piece that I published um, uh, earlier this year that I co-authored with Vanessa Diaz on, on what we call racio ontologies, uh, part of what I was so struck by, and I've been disturbed by this from the moment that it happened, uh, in the closing arguments of the trial of George Zimmerman after he killed uh, a 15-year-old uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, an African-American boy, um, George Zimmerman's uh, a, a defense attorney in the closing arguments brought in, uh, he, he disputed the claim that Trayvon Martin was unarmed during their altercation by bringing in a slab of concrete and displaying it before the jury. And he suggested to the jury that Trayvon Martin was in fact armed during their altercation with the concrete that he walked on, uh, such that the concrete was weaponized when this 15 year old black boy walked on it and, and such that he was understood or imagined as using it as, a, uh, as a, a weapon against George Zimmerman in such a convincing way that it ex exculpates George Zimmerman in the killing of Trayvon Martin. And so to be clear, when Trayvon Martin is carrying Skittles and soda, they, be, they are weaponized as potential, uh, potential uh, guns or knives uh, they're criminalized as potential drug paraphernalia. The sidewalk is not the sidewalk. And I've just been, I've been disturbed by this from, from that moment. I mean, to be clear, prior to that moment. Um, but I guess that gets to this question of, for me, semiotic relativity. From who's, who, gets to, who gets to walk on the sidewalk and, and it's a sidewalk? And for whom is it a potential, does it become understood or is it transformed? Uh, and that's what, you know, this is hence the, the, the analysis that Vanessa Diaz and I advance of, of racial ontologies. It's a, it's a racial and ontological transformation where uh, for some of us at any given moment, our entire bodies are transformed altogether and weaponized and criminalized in ways that uh, in the, the killing, for example, of uh, Michael Brown uh, by police officer Darren Wilson and uh, in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, Darren uh, Wilson claimed that Michael Brown was uh, 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 who's an unarmed teenager and Darren Wilson is, is the armed police officer in that killing. He claimed that uh, that Michael Brown felt like a giant and made him and made the police officer feel like a little boy. To be clear, they're the same height. They're six foot four. But Michael Brown was imagined as being gigantic and taller and huge. Uh, and, and, and threatening uh, in response to the armed police officer who took Michael Brown's life, killed Michael Brown. And so in, that, in, in this respect, I'm interested in the ways that these, uh, you know, and I, I, I should say, um, as I point to these examples of violence, um, you know, I, I don't want to do so casually. Um, I, I, but I, part of what I'm trying to identify is the extent to which the realities that we navigate on the world, uh, on the day to day, are not straightforward at all, and need to, and their fundamental nature needs to be reconsidered. The, I should say, the role of race in constituting their fundamental nature needs to be reconsidered altogether. So, which is why I'm, I'm foregrounding those those particular uh, incidents. Thank you, Jonathan. Jen, did you have anything that you would like to add at the time? All right. no, I think this you. actually, great, thank you. This links us nicely to a more sort of general question about semiotics. Uh, one of our attendees is asking to hear a bit more about ways that you see semiotic approaches as limiting attention to issues of power and inequality. I, sh I should say, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to make claims that all semiotic approaches uh, are necessarily inattentive to power. Of course, you know, uh, many scholars, I mean, that, that was, I think, what I wanted to emphasize um, in terms of the ways that uh, a whole range of scholars um, have have focused on power, have used semiotic approaches. And I have tried to do so as well. I, I, I strive to do so in, in my own work. The concern is that they can, in some situations, ironically, um, define context 
in ways that are inattentive to particular historical relations. And so if semiotics is a careful attention to the relationship, the dynamic interplay between signs and context, then the question is from whose perspectives are what contexts relevant um, in relation to which signs. And so what I'm concerned about is the ways that particular analyses cordon off history altogether such that you know, we can engage in an analysis of an interaction without attending to the role of historically uh, institutionalized structures play in producing the roles that people are inhabiting. And so if we just analyze this, I, fi I find many, uh, many uh, analyses to be deeply presentist in their nature, hence the need for, in my view, a need for a different uh, uh, analysis or conceptualization of presenting. I'm interested in, in what, what kind of present people are analyzing and what histories they understand to be in play and what histories they foreclosed altogether. And I think this is the question that many activists are asking us to grapple with right now. What is the United States? What are the Americas and what is the modern world? And how have we privileged? This is, you know, very, the idea that the United States is a democracy, is a liberal democracy. Whose, whose perspective is privileged in this? And the, the, uh, again, the, the continued, continued sort of um, uh, sense that we need to return to something and that where we are right now is fundamentally different from uh, uh, previous moments. Um, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, which contexts are relevant to which people and, and why. And, and I, I want to, to kind of, this is why I want to uh, advocate for this analysis of disorder. Great, thank you. Jen, did you have anything you'd like to add on? Yeah, I, um, I'm actually, I'm personally excited about this reframing of um, semiotics through indexical disorder. I don't see, I didn't personally see the argument as, um, Jonathan's argument as, you know, semiotic approaches are limiting attention to power inequality, but what kinds of power inequality are being presented for analysis and why do we focus on those and what, you know, and not others, for example. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have that right, right, Jonathan? <laughs> Yeah, I would just say that that's that's absolutely right. I mean, I and I, th this is the work that I do. I, semiotics is the, the 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 central framework that organizes my thinking. The question is which contexts are are relevant and which power relations are relevant in one's semiotic analysis. And I find that in many of our foundational our foundational concepts, there is no analysis of history or power that informs those concepts. Those concepts just live in the world. What world is that, and whose world is it? All right, thank you, Jonathan and Jen. I think one of the really exciting things about both of your points is that these, these questions that we ask are a matter of life and death realities in a lot of cases that are structured historically and institutionally by race. That it's not just that there's something about a semiotic conceptual apparatus that forces us to ignore these things, but historically that seems to be what ends up happening. Um, and it's important to sort of reintroduce those things back into the, the center of how we are doing our own conceptualization. Uh, this actually leads to a question that I had myself, um, just sort of turning our attention to the fact that people do think in a range of context that things like order and normalcy are the natural state of things. And obviously I have my own ideas about this, but I was interested in hearing from both of you about where this leaves us as analysts, but also as people inhabiting social worlds of various kinds, as far as ideas of order and normalcy are, are concerned. What becomes of these categories in a sense? I, so I, I appreciate this question, um, Josh, because I think it's important for us to implicate ourselves in, in potentially kind of uh, enacting and reproducing the very systems that we're analyzing. And this is always something that Michael Silverstein warned against. And I have to say, I mean, I, I part of um, Michael's contribution and, and central role in, in formulating the, the uh, conceptualization of the language ideologies framework is, you know, the, the piece, the limits of awareness um, I'm, I'm just so struck by the ways that uh, many um, advocates of critical language awareness often seem um, not to be engaged with 
this question about um, what it is that we are prone to be aware of and in what ways. Why are we, why is our awareness drawn, our attention drawn to particular forms and practices and relations and not others? And I think that um, Michael's question there is so, so important and his intervention there is, is so absolutely crucial. And uh, for me, um, this involves, again, and, and this is in response to your question, Josh, this involves not absolving ourselves individually. So I worry that, you know, um, it's it's funny of you know throughout one's career one encounters responses to one's work um, that take various forms. Uh, the a response I often encounter is that my work is ideological, and I tend to say thank you very much. Um, the question is which ideologies are organizing your work and which are organizing mine. But yes, water is wet. Um, thank you. And so I, I guess what I want to 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 own in my work is the the unique uh, kinds of things that I think that I attend to while also recognizing my unique ignorances and the things that I'm numb to and the things that I don't attend to, which is why I pointed to some of these feminist frameworks um, that have been central to my thinking and pushed my thinking really powerfully. Um, so I, I, I would uh, suggest that, um, and, and, and I don't mean to just generalize uh, feminist frameworks. I, 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 we could talk in a longer conversation about the specific and, and the distinctive kinds of feminist frameworks involved in a project like linguistic anthropology. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is, I, I, this is, this is not a, a project of absolution of trying to position myself as somehow outside of these power relations in a way that allows me um, to be uh, to, to analyze them without being complicit in their reproduction. Um, and, and if anything, I want to encourage all of us to sort of cultivate uh, an engagement that uh, attends to that to which we're, we're prone to be numb and, and why. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Jen, did you have anything to add? To um, actually, Josh, can you repeat your question? <laughs> Yes, my question was, I sort of at a at a base level, it's about where we where we stand with the concepts of normalcy and order in our own analyses. What what do we make of these concepts once we sort of accept that we are implicated, as Jonathan just put it, that what what becomes of these in terms of the work that we do? I mean, I honestly, that is an ongoing question that I tackle every time I sit down to write. <laughs> That's a, um, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, it's, it's something that's always at the back of my mind. Like, how do I, how do I undo what I'm doing? It almost makes the project of analysis impossible in some ways. Um, but I think it's important. And as long as we keep striving towards thinking that way, um, we make at least some progress. Right. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, I think one of the important things that came out of both your replies is that you know, this anti-racist gender equity work is never done. And that we're always trying to find racism and gender inequity wherever it exists, including in ourselves. That we don't get to just sort of dust our hands and say like, you know, I'm now doing a racio-linguistic analysis. I'm, I'm free to stop worrying about these things, right? Um, I did want to- Josh, Josh actually, can I jump in? in, in oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. That I, I really appreciate that comment so much because one of my concerns is with the uptake of so-called ratio-linguistics, um, plural, nominal, plural. Um, I, I'm deeply concerned with the under-theorized uptake of that nominalization of ratio-linguistics and the way that it seems many uh, deployments of it seem um, disengaged from particular kinds of historical realities and seem uh, tied to or linked to um, these efforts to sort of signal that one is engaging in critical scholarship. Um, and, and I guess um, this, these performative gestural kind of critical moves, um, I, I'm worried about them. And I, I want to suggest that I don't, I'm not, I don't, you know, whether you call something ratio-linguistic, this or that, or whether you use the term indexical disorder, you know, I'm interested in what you're up to, what your commitments are, what your political commitments are, what informs your commitments and what work you're advancing. And so whether you do it under the auspices of a particular framework or with a particular label um, are, are less significant to me. And I worry that for many people, the labels themselves are, are understood as doing the work 
or signaling what the work is doing, when in fact, I see invocations of race and language within so-called racio-linguistics that are entirely essentializing and presume that there is a set discrete set of linguistic forms that correspond to every racial and ethnic category. And I say to myself, that was the entire point of this, this conceptualization is to unsettle what Adrian Lowe and Angela Reyes and Elaine Chun have talked about as and, and written about as the distinctiveness paradigm and sociolinguistics and really trying to push back against that paradigm because of the ways that it's complicit in the reproduction of this kind of neoliberal system that defines diversity in really particular ways and then creates rubrics of authenticity that people have to live up to and then we get Jessica Krug. And so I, I guess I want us to kind of think really critically about the, the superficial deployment of labels like racio-linguistics um, because I, yeah, whether you call it racio-linguistics or something else, I wanna know what you're up to. All right, thank you. This is a really important uh, reminder as well. Jen, did you have anything that you wanted to say at this time? No, thank you. All right, I feel like this links very nicely to one of the new questions from Eris that just came up in our queue. Um, thinking about this, the impossibility of jumping off the society train, which I really, I like that turn of phrase. The impossibility of jumping off the society train and bringing it a bit closer to home and asking, Quote, I'm wondering in what ways we can exist within a neoliberal capitalist system, specifically the academy, while also trying to deconstruct it with the ways that we frame our research question. So can you say something about the ways that focusing on ideologies can work in the deconstruction of structures of racism? Uh, hold on a second. I, I want to put this question uh, uh, back on Aris, uh, you know, because I have, so Aris is a, 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 a brilliant doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin, whose research I understand to be enacting that, that which she is asking about. So Aris's research is really trying to push against the idea that blackness and Latinidad are separate from one another and that the Spanish language is relevant only for particular populations or uh, really trying to challenge the decontextualized and um, historically decontextualized framings of the Spanish language apart from colonialism and apart from very particular populations experiences. And so I actually see um, Aris doing the work in, um, in her own research that she's asking about. So that's the first thing I would want to say. Um, but I, for me, uh, part of this, um, part of the, the work of uh, existing within a university, look, you know, I always have to say, when I teach at Stanford University and I teach on inequality or, you know, and systems, structures of power. So we have to recognize that we're, that it, there's a, a satirical kind of, uh, a potentially satirical quality to the conversation that we're having at the country club about inequality, when the whole point of its existence is to reproduce hierarchy on some level. Or I, I, I should say the condition of possibility for its existence is hierarchy. That's not necessarily the point of its, uh, of its existence altogether. And it's not all that it can achieve or do. And I guess that's, that's the issue to me, that while we are part of these institutions, that we can have one foot in and one foot out. And that's, you know, that's the, the stance that I try to, to take in relation to a range of, of structures, whether they're disciplinary structures or institutional structures. I think that there are all kinds of possibilities to build relationships across what seem like really fixed borders and narrowly defined borders that allow us to, to pursue different kinds of projects, different political commitments, different community relationships, to ask questions about different people's experiences, to center different people as theorists rather than just as objects of analysis. And so for me, um, there are a whole, there are infinite possibilities for redirecting what the academy could be up to. And in and, and so much of my work, what I've tried to do is to think about um, what kinds of collaborations. And so you, you, you saw, I think in my presentation, almost all of the, the, the sorts of pieces of mine that I reference are co-authored pieces. And I think many linguistic anthropologists, well, we would have to talk about, you know, um, you know what, what the, the significance of collaborative work um, can be and, and what kinds of collaborations, not just with ourselves as scholars, but with the communities that we're, we're working with, um, what, what possibilities they hold. So um, yeah, I, I'm ex excited about what we could be up to. Jen, did you have anything that you'd like to add on to that? Um, not really. I think Jonathan really said it all, actually. Thank you. Great, thanks. And also uh, just you know, to anyone out there who is on a search committee right now, uh, be on the lookout for an application. Uh, 
Aris responds saying, I don't have a job yet and that should change. So just, you know, note to, to everyone here who may be able to do that. Um, we have time for one final question. This one did not appear in the Q&A thread just because it was posed by Konstantin Kassis, who is one of our, uh, who's one of the panelists here and panelists don't have the power to pose questions. So I'm going to read this now. Kostis asks, or begins by saying, sorry, he doesn't ask yet. Thank you for this wonderful, challenging talk. Disorder has a kind of organization, not ironically, and you've done such a great job to describe it. I wonder how we can think comparatively about forms of indexical order. So Costas is working in South India and questions of caste, religion, and other forms of difference are at play, though certainly are comparable. So how might we think across types of power relations with the concept in different types or kinds of disorder? So, so um, Costas, I, 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 I see you've seen my, my challenging talk and raised me a challenging question uh, in many ways, and I appreciate this um, so much. I, I guess part of the struggle is um, analogy and what's, what, what possibilities emerge out of analogy and, and what are the limitations of particular kinds of analogies and, and what assumptions um, do those analogies lead us um, to make about relationships between different populations experiences. But I wanna be clear that in any political, so I wanna think about this politically and, and analytically. Politically, I wanna think about the significance of solidarity that emerges from you know, um, what might seem like a, a, a superficial analogy in, in some situation that, that could lead to, to uh, what, what some call, or what Savannah Shange and others have called um, thick solidarity. Um, analytically, to me, um, to think about the, the relationship between different forms of order and disorder, and I, appreciate, I also appreciate Kosa's question about the structuring nature of disorder and the, the idea that, yeah, disorder doesn't escape structure on, on any level, um, but it's a different, you know, it's a different frame um, um, for structure. And so to me, I think this is precisely the work that many of uh, that many of us are up to, um, and, and I, I'm an, I'm being pushed. I have to say, you know, I my uh, my undergraduate students are pushing me. I my my students in in Latinx studies at at Stanford are really pushing me. They're saying we're sick of this nation state model of Latinx studies, where we talk about Puerto Ricans in the United States, Mexicans in the United States, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, Dominicans in the United States. Why those generalizing frames? What about indigeneity and blackness in the Americas? And how do those homogenizing frames prevent us from actually understanding the colonial relationships across the Americas? And how do we inadvertently recuperate a US nationalism in our analyses of very, uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our, our nation state sort of um, framing of our work? And so um, I think it's exciting to, to sort of understand a, a different set of, of relations, uh, potential relations globally. And, and to me, um, what I've been excited to work on uh, more recently is uh, you know, a, a, a set of conversations with colleagues um, throughout the world who are, are, are thinking about coloniality, uh, various kinds of manifestations of coloniality and, and so-called post-coloniality and their relations with one another, such that these ideas about race are not just US narrowly US based sorts of issues. And it's been, it's fascinating um, to encounter people for whom, um, uh, from whose perspectives race is this weird American aberration or, or weird US aberration um, uh, as compared to those for whom um, race exists throughout the world to the extent that race is understood as a, a set of colonial, a rearticulation of a set of colonial distinctions and the sort of uh, ideological the ideological boundary between Europe and non-Europe, which is of course not fixed by any means whatsoever. And of course, all of us can be recruited to inhabit both sides of that boundary in a whole range of ways and to reproduce the boundary itself. Um, so I, I think trying to, to draw some of these connections um, is really important. And, and uh, in many ways, that's the work that I, I hope to do moving forward. And so um, it might be a somewhat unsatisfying response, but I think, um, I think that there are, are many possibilities for drawing so, some new connections, while also recognizing some particularities and specificities. Um, to, so, so resisting a sort of superficial analogy. Of, of let's say Thank a you, superficial Jonathan. analogy that equates caste and, and race, for example. We have to be very careful.
Great, thank you. We are out of time for today. I wanted to give you both one final opportunity to share any last words that you may have before we close our session. And if you have no final words, that's fine as well. All right, if not, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to- I just wanna say it's Friday evening in, uh, or, or late afternoon in the West Coast US and Friday evening elsewhere. So, you know, um, it's Halloween weekend and people are trying to survive a pandemic. So uh, I, I'm appreciative of people's engagement and, uh, and I look forward to future conversations, but enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who attended this talk and thank you to Jonathan for the for the wonderful for the wonderful talk. Great. Once again, thank you to both of you, Jonathan and Jen. Uh, if you have been unable to ask your questions in the audience today, we hope that you will join us again on December 11th for the final colloquium, where we will be inviting all of our speakers back to reflect as a panel on the entire presidential election. You will have the opportunity to ask questions again there. So here's a reminder that if you are registered for the December 11 final colloquium through Eventbrite, you are automatically registered for all of the speaker events and all you have to do is open the Zoom link at the time of each event in order to attend them. It will be the same Zoom link for each event. Our next event features a double bill lineup with Norma Mendoza Denton from the University of California, Los Angeles and Janet McIntosh from Brandeis University who will be co-presenting on the topic of quote, race and gender panics in the 2020 Trump campaign. If you would like to revisit any part of the presentation today or if you have friends who could not make it today, we will be sharing a link to a recording of the presentation at a later date through your registered Eventbrite email address. And if you would like to receive further updates about similar events or content in the future, please follow the Society for Linguistic Anthropology on Facebook and Twitter. Also, please remember to vote if you are eligible and have not done so already. And once again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your Friday evenings.